Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our MOASC uh, cutaneous uh, 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 cancer webinar that we are, we're, we're doing a, a few times a year. That tonight, uh, Dr. Daniels and I are going to uh, introduce it a, a, an exciting discussion, which I think a few years back there was really very little to, to offer. And that's uh, updates in the management of ocular melanoma. A a we've come a long way in the management of this, you know, uh, uh, rare but devastating disease. Um, and so I, I think all of us are, are excited to hear about uh, what's going on uh, in the clinic and, and in the lab and, uh, and what's going to come out uh, in the future to help our patients further. Um, Dr. Greg Daniels from... UC San Diego uh, uh, melanoma specialist uh, will be uh, moderating along with me. And we have a, a number of exciting panelists. Uh, Dr. Daniels, I'll, I'll have you uh, perhaps introduce uh, the panels and then we'll go from there. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And thanks everybody for joining. I agree um, things are evolving in ocular melanoma finally. And uh, it's um, a good time to kind of update ourselves and we probably overused the word expert in the field, but I really feel we got three experts in the field tonight. Happy they're, they're here and giving us their time. Dr. Scott uh, is here at uh, UCSD. Is a, I call him an ocular oncologist, um, has trained uh, medical school at Harvard and residency in Florida and a fellowship, um, really sp specializing in um, uveal melanoma here and uh, being a lead. And uh, Dr. Berman, who uh, was at um, Case Western Medical School, I hope I got that right. And then, um, but has been uh, homegrown also at UCSD um, doing interventional radiology and uh, recently has um, done a lot of work, um, yeah, including uh, uveal melanomas and uh, for interventional radiology, and I'll talk. And then lastly, Dr. Hamid, who needs no introduction, um, as uh, he's been leading uh, not just in ocular, but uh, cutaneous melanoma and other things up at uh, the Angeles Clinic, uh, affiliated with uh, Cedars, uh, did his training at uh, USC and uh, partied like it was 1999. I think he graduated and uh, and then stayed on at SC for residency and fellowship and uh, really excited about hearing um, uh, some background and then hopefully from the audience, um, some some questions for this panel. Um, so I'll turn it over first to Dr. Scott to lead us off. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, I, I do need to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Sue Park, um, who has been uh, relentless in getting these um, these sessions organized, and I think, are really helpful. But they don't happen without somebody um, really pushing and making them happen. And uh, Dr. Park uh, has been uh, doing that for us in conjunction with Moask. So, okay. Let me just let me just also interject and say that if uh, people have questions, um, you can provide them in the in the chat room. We'll review them, and then we'll have a, a time to open up for open discussion. Uh, 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 later on after each of the presenters completes their, their session and at the end. Thank you. So it's not letting me uh, share the screen. Um, is there any way we can activate that? And I guess while we wait, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, my name is Nathan Scott. I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon and ocular oncologist. Um, here at UC San Diego, and happy to be here. Um, thank you, everyone, for allowing me to participate. Yeah, you have the sharing yet? Let's see. You should okay. have it now. It, it should work now. Go ahead. Very confused. We see your, um, there, perfect. Is that actually showing? It looks like a huge window for me. Is that okay? If you switch screens. Um, I have like might... screens going here, give me. Okay. 
you mean put it like on a different is there yeah. now we just see your presentation is that what now, you want to see? now we see your notes oh notes are good all right how's that good all right perfect so um, we're going to talk a bit about neoadjuvant therapies and uva melanoma. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys actually see what it looks like in the eye, primary disease. So um, I'm going to show you some pictures and sort of talk about exactly what we see on the ocular sort of side of things and sort of go through that briefly as well for the first uh, few slides. And let's see, I have no financial disclosures. So yeah, so I imagine most of you already know this, uh, but uva melanoma emanates from the uvea, which comprises of three structures within the eye, the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. As you can see here, these are the different structures within the eye where uva melanoma can develop. Um, uva melanoma is the most common primary intraocular malignancy in adults. It comes from melanocytes. And importantly, this is the only real relationship that it has with the more common cutaneous or skin melanoma. Um, they come from the same cell type, but otherwise they behave completely differently in terms of prognosis, metastatic spread, genetic mutational burden, and then therefore treatment. Um, this is a very rare uh, cancer with only about 2,000 patients or so per year in the United States. Within the umbrella of uv melanoma, iris melanoma is the most rare, comprising of only about 5 to 8% of cases. They also have the lowest rate of metastasis at approximately around 5% within 10 years of treatment. Um, there's probably a component of this that relates to early diagnosis, um, presentation is around a decade earlier than for the other lesions. Um, this is likely because patients and providers alike can sort of see the lesions more readily and follow them for change. Uh, the ciliary body is affected in approximately 12% of patients. These, on the other hand, are often very delayed in diagnosis. This is because they can hide behind the iris and they can go undetected until they have either shifted the lens to the side, causing a change in glasses prescription or uh, a new unilateral cataract. Or as you can see here uh, in the middle picture, it uh, burrows its way to the surface of the eye. The most common form of uva melanoma is from the choroid. About 80% of cases are in the choroid. These most common uh, come from uh, choroidal nevi or choroidal freckles. Um, so approximately about six to six and a half percent of the Caucasian population have choroidal nevi with about a one in 10,000 chance of malignant transformation. The prevalence of choroidal nevi is often pretty deb debated um, just because the way that they came up with that number, six to six and a half percent, really didn't look at too much of the eye in general. Um, so our wider field imaging probably suggests that it's more likely 12 percent, maybe even 15 percent of the population have these lesions. Importantly, um, oftentimes a biopsy is not actually required to make um, a diagnosis. Just using our clinical exam and our imaging findings, we can make an, our accuracy is around 95 to 99% in making the diagnosis. This is using the clinic, clinical features that you see here in this uh, picture grid, tumor size probably being the most important, and then ultrasonography and symptoms as well. But the most important thing is we oftentimes don't need a diagnosis, uh, don't need a biopsy in order to make the diagnosis at all. But we still do tend to biopsy um, these. I think more and more people are biopsying them, um, mostly because it can give us uh, prognostic information, which we won't really talk about too much but today, but it does sort of, um, you know, will certainly play a role as, uh, as different treatments for uveal melanoma um, start to gain some traction. Treatment options include observation, which is not typically recommended. Diode transpupillary thermotherapy for small tumors and recurrences is sometimes considered, but the mainstay is really radiation, radiotherapy. Uh, most commonly, plaque radiotherapy seen here in the picture. You can see that there are these little... It, basically consists of a gold disc with these small seeds that look like grains of rice. The plate is sutured to the surface of the eye and left in place for about three to seven days. 
This is the most common treatment. Some centers use proton beam therapy, and then more rarely you can perform a local resection uh, or for tumors that are too large to safely treat with radiation. Unfortunately, a nucleation or eye removal is still performed not too infrequently. But historically, a nucleation or eye removal was the only option. It wasn't until the COMS trial in the early 2000s, the majority of eyes diagnosed with uva melanoma were simply enucleated. We would just remove them. Um, the COMS trial in the early 2000s showed that outcomes comparing removing the eye versus radiation therapy were about the same for medium-sized tumors. So we've now moved into this landscape where we've started to save the eye and we no longer have to... Uh, completely enucleate people. In fact, with modern treatment in eyes with tumors that are small enough to receive radiation, most centers have a single surgery success rate of about 95%. And here are two examples of an iris tumor and a carotal tumor pre and post uh, brachytherapy. You can see they've regressed nicely and this is what they will typically look like for the remainder of the patient's life. Unfortunately, while we've gotten really good at saving the eye, patients still tend to lose vision. Um, radiation not only eliminates the tumor cells, but it also damages the normal structures within the eye, most notably the macula and the optic nerve. In fact, the COMS trial that we talked about earlier um, showed that about greater than 50% of patients were legally blind or worse at three years following radiation. So we've been able to save the eye and we're getting great success with radiation therapy, but unfortunately patients were still not really able to see out of these eyes in the long term. So more recently, as radiation technology has improved, we're now able to create plaques that are customized to the specific tumor dimensions within the eye. Less radiation equals less damage, and this has improved visual acuity greatly just by reducing the amount of radiation to important structures within the eye. We have also started to do intravitreal injections, anti-VEGF medications, and steroids are currently being studied, and many of us have seen drastic improvement in not only treating radiation damage, but possibly preventing vision loss in high-risk patients. Unfortunately, this requires that patients come in anywhere from monthly to quarterly um, to receive injections directly into their eye. I did about 30 of them today, um, and you can imagine what kind of burden this is for patients to have to come in every single month for me to put a needle into their eye for this medication just to potentially try to preserve some of their vision after these radiation treatments. And that really is where we currently are with UV, uh, UV melanoma treatment today. Um, we have great success with irradiation, but patients still slowly lose vision. And unfortunately, many eyes have tumors that are too large to irradiate at all. Um, too much radiation uh, can cause the eye wall to essentially melt, it can be extremely painful, and then we have to remove the eye anyway. Um, so for now, right now, if the tumor is too large, we have to remove the eye up front. Um, we're going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about neoadjuvant therapy. The most Recent push for neoadjuvant therapy has been to try and address exactly this concern. Um, but first, I think it's a little bit interesting that uh, in about one to two places in the United States, but mostly overseas, there have been a lot of attempts to treat with local, ne local neoadjuvant therapy. And then we'll sort of go into the systemic neoadjuvant uh, treatments that uh, are a little more promising today. So starting with local radiation, um, the first neoadjuvant radiation treatment for uva melanoma was actually not for primary disease. Um, it was instead used to see if irradiating the eye prior to enucleation would mitigate the development of metastasis. And this is from that same COMS trial that we talked about earlier from the early 2000s, where they looked at radiation versus enucleation in medium-sized tumors. Well, there was a parallel arm that basically was looking at large tumor size, eyes that were under, going to undergo a nucleation regardless, um, they basically split them into two groups, one that received pre-enucleation radiation and the other one that just went under a nucleation. And they basically showed that it did nothing to improve uh, um, death of metastasis at 10 years, um, as you can see here. Very few centers, mostly abroad, still use surgery as a primary treatment for UV melanoma. Um, this first study here, they looked at adjuvant brachytherapy versus neoadjuvant uh, proton beam therapy in conjunction with transscleral resection. Transscleral resection is when basically you, um, 
you cut into the wall of the eye and flap down the sclera, that's the white part of the eye, and then you sort of manually pull the tumor out of the eye and then flap the scleral wall back um, and, and close it up. And here, uh, local recurrence was significantly lower for the pretreatment proton beam therapy group, but metastasis was largely equivalent. So not too many centers do um, this type of radical uh, procedure. This second study here um, looked at endoresection, which is a different type of um, uh, debulking of the tumor. This is when you actually go into the eye and you remove uh, as much of the tumor as you can from the inside of the eye, meaning they do debulk the tumor after proton beam ther therapy, and they show that there was no real difference in the nucleation rates. Um, this was more of a study to, um, this is a more recent study, so metastasis wasn't really that high. And then finally, this last study here, they did neoadjuvant proton beam therapy with transcleral resection. Um, here, really just highlighting how high the, uh, the surgical complication rate was. It looks like they pretty much lost the vision in most of these eyes, looking around at around 70%. In terms of neoadjuvant surgical treatment, the first paper here is a case report where they went in and did debulking, again, endoresecting um, as much of the tumor as they could. Essentially, they had a tumor that was looking towards a nucleation. They debulked um, the inside of the tumor from the inside of the eye and then performed radiation. And this seemed to work pretty well, although this didn't really help with the patient's vision at all. And then uh, the study next to it, um, you can see some pictures on how we do our scleral resections for these tumors. And this was a 15-year study comparing um, brachytherapy after transcellular resection versus brachytherapy alone. And they basically highlighted in this study that the brachytherapy group didn't do as well as the one that also included transcellular resection. Um, again, with the postoperative cl complications um, likely being much higher um, in this group. So again, not something that many of us are doing today. One group did um, this is a, in terms of pharmaceuticals, um, this is a phase two non-randomized trial that was terminated early because all of the patients progressed while receiving intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy to see if this would reduce the size of the tumors. Unfortunately, all of them grew, all of them required a nucleation. So it's pretty um, well established that intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy does not um, um, improve tumor size for uvin melanoma. And then finally, here is a case report looking at intraarterial chemotherapy, um, where they snake a catheter um, through the femoral artery up to the ophthalmic artery and inject melphalan directly towards the eye, which is exactly what we do for retinoblastoma um, patients for our kids. Um, and this actually did cause significant reduction in the tumor size, and the patient was supposed to undergo a nucleation, but ultimately ended up having uh, a tumor size that was... Um, uh, amenable to brachytherapy, and this patient did really well. So this is um, something that I have not seen that many people are doing, but I thought was an interesting neoadjuvant case report. And the most promising therapy to date is Darabacertib, uh, the Darabacertib trial with IDEA. So now we'll sort of briefly talk a little bit about what was presented at ASCO in 2024. Um, the idea here is that we typically have two types of patients with poor ocular outcomes. The first is the group that present with tumors that are too large for standard of care. Um, radiation would ultimately cause too many complications and they typically get enucleated. And the second group are where the tumor is small enough for radiotherapy, but maybe it's too close to the important structures within the eye, the optic nerve and the macula, and you're essentially guaranteed vision loss, and you're basically trying to shrink the tumor away from these structures prior to treating with radiation. And I think that would be pretty much here. Yeah, and that's just showing the tumor going away. So what is Darabacertib? It is a PKC inhibitor that targets the known dysregulated molecular pathways uh, that lead to the development of uvin melanoma. It has documented activity in uvin melanoma that has already spread to the rest of the body um, and otherwise serves as a bit of a unique target to combat primary uvin melanoma growth. Here is an example that was presented at ASCO who, uh, 
where this is a patient who received six months of the PKC inhibitor followed by radiation. And you can kind of see here um, that the tumor had a really nice response. That yellow dot in the middle with the vessels is the optic nerve. And directly to the right of that is the macula. So you can see the tumor nicely shrinking away from those structures um, right before they decided to um, do definitive plaque breaking therapy. And these are the uh, patient characteristics from the abstract that was published, um, noting mainly here that these were really large tumors. The diameter was 15.6 millimeters and the thickness was 9.7 millimeters. Um, so big tumors and they had a pretty good response as we'll see. The study design, the primary endpoint was feasibility and tolerability, tolerability of neoadjuvant and adjuvant darabacertib. Um, and then secondary endpoints were salvage rate from the nucleation, which is kind of what I was most uh, excited about. And they looked at a few other things that you can see here, but it was largely a proof, proof of concept study. They showed that there was a significant median reduction in tumor size of around 30%. You can see most of the patients that they treated did have a reduction in size. Only two um, um, actually grew under, um, during the treatment time as well as a median reduction in volume of around 47%, um, as you can see here as well. Adverse events were pretty manageable with grade three re reactions and only three patients um, for rash and syncope. Otherwise, it was pretty um, um, benign from what they presented. And here is just another um, sort of look at what the implications are for plaque planning and vision. So this is a patient um, who had a really large tumor. It's sitting right next to the optic nerve and is somewhat in the macula and the supratemporal quadrant. And you can see that uh, they, they use a math model to suggest the probability of vision loss at one year of around 67% to 95% at three years. Um, this is, again, uh, 2200 vision, which would be considered legally blind. And um, this reduction was pretty substantial with... Um, with uh, shrinking of the tumor with Darabacitib. And remarkably, 75% of the eyes in this cohort were saved um, from a nucleation. And in these photos, you can see how the tumor shrinks away from the optic nerve and the fovea and the most important structures for the visual um, um, parts of the eye. Future data will give us more information about how this not only affects vision, um, but um, something that we did not talk about here, something um, we're all hoping this also improves is metastatic rates and outcomes is if you're, if while you're taking darabacertib in the neoadjuvant setting, does this reduce um, uh, metastasis in our high risk patients? Future trials, there is a trial that um, uh, is, should be coming out for tabentafusp in the neoadjuvant setting. This is not yet enrolling. I believe this will come out at, um, it's being started at Jefferson, I believe. And then I did find one uh, trial that I believe started a few years ago. It doesn't look like they've enrolled any patients looking at melphalan chemo reduction in that IAC setting from that case report that we saw before, but um, to be to be determined, I suppose. That's really all I have. If um, anyone has any questions um, about these trials or even melanoma in general. No, um, why don't we, if it's okay, if you can stay for the whole uh, time, we'll go to we're going to have uh, questions at the end because total is uh, one hour. So we got to give uh, Dr. Berman, Dr. Hamid some time here. So next up, uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Scott. That will, as usual, I've uh, learned even more. Uh, Dr. Berman's going to um, go on to the next phase of, uh, of life, which is sometimes these patients metastasize and uh, livers the predominant place. So uh, Dr. Berman's been a partner uh, for now a while, and he's going to outline his therapies. Hey, thank you. Hmm. You cannot, you can request multiple presenters. Hmm. Um, sure, Nicole's on it. To you should be good. All right, we should be good now. All right. So, yeah, thank you for the introduction and, and, uh, and uh, invitation to, to come speak. Uh, my name is Zach Berman. I'm an interventional oncologist here at UCSD. Um, I'm going to be talking today about liver-directed therapy for ocular melanoma. My practice is, is kind of centered around the liver, 
and uh, you know, advancing our techniques for a lot of different types of therapies. In particular, how can we use local regional therapies to augment an immune response for a lot of different therapies? And I think that'll be important as I kind of talk about um, where we sit now for ocular melanoma. There's three main uh, ways we treat metastatic ocular melanoma to the liver. Um, and again, for you know, such a rare disease, it very commonly metastasizes to the liver. About 40% of patients at 10 years will have metastasis outside of the eye. And of those, about 90 to 95% of those are going to go to the liver. For whatever reason, this, this particular tumor likes to migrate to the liver. The three main ways um, that have been studied in the past have been chemoembolization, which we'll talk a little bit about, chemoperfusion or hepatic perfusion, which uh, I think has been kind of the big craze all of these days. We'll talk about that. Um, radioembolization, TER, Y90, CERT, other names for it. And then I think intraarterial immunotherapy, which might be the future. So chemoembolization, chemosaturation is kind of exactly as it sounds like. The idea is we're gonna use the arteries um, in order to saturate uh, the liver and all of the tumors inside of the liver uh, with some sort of anti-neoplastic uh, medication. And the delivery for it can be very different depending on the different types of uh, treatment intents and anti-neoplastic agents that we'll be using. Um, so initially, a lot of this was done with cisplatin um, just through a hepatic arterial infusion. Uh, however, a lot of that didn't pan out. Um, so different variations of, of that was attempted over time, and eventually we landed on um, BCNU, um, which is, you can see the element there, name right there, um, which is an alkylating agent. Um, the reason why it kind of stuck, um, particularly um, for hepatic delivery, is that it's very, very um, lipophilic, uh, which allows us to dissolve it in um, thiodized poppy seed oil, sometimes called lipiodol. Uh, which is how we do a lot of our chemoembolizations and other embolizations inside of the liver. Um, and BCNU is six times more lipophilic than cisplatin. So the uh, drug is going to stay diluted in the uh, uh, fat emulsion that we're going to embolize with, which then will sit in the liver, avoiding the first pass effect and uh, um, you know have a higher drug concentration inside of the tumor. Um, there's been one prospective phase two trial with a bunch of retrospective studies. It had an objective response rate of about 20%. While that may not seem very high, and particularly in the setting of having a median overall survival of only about 5.2% or 5.2 months, you can see here there's a dramatic change um, in overall survival depending on if patients respond or don't respond. For a lot of these patients who have eventual metastasis to the liver, the main cause of mortality is actually going to be liver dysfunction or some sort of complication from um, liver, their, their liver disease. So for patients that we can have a response to some sort of you know, local therapy with BCNU, uh, we can have a median overall survival of about 22 months versus those who had progressive disease, it's pretty dismal at 3.3 3 months. Um, and for those who did have um, hepatic disease control from um, chemoembolization, um, you can see for most of these patients, they actually end up succumbing to extrahepatic um, uh, metastasis and worsening of that compared to uh, the intrahepatic. So if we're able to control what's going on in the liver, we can have an increased um, and durable um, survival rate. And you can see here on the right, um, this may actually uh, be strongly correlated with the degree of hepatic replacement by tumors. So the patients who have less tumor replacement do better than those who um, have more tumor replacement. This kind of um, bred the next generation of, of uh, kind of chemo intraarterial infusion, which is where kind of where we're at today. This is kind of a fancier chemo delivery. Uh, this is a schematic of what the Delcath procedure, Hepzato is the name of it, where it's intraarterial melphalan. Um, directly into the hepatic artery uh, with simultaneous extraction um, from the blood uh, as it goes through the liver and then filtered and then put back in um, to the blood. This is a very complicated slide. So I kind of kind of dumbed it down a little bit, but the whole procedure is, is fairly straightforward. You stick a catheter into the aorta. The aorta then goes to the hepatic artery and you have a catheter inside of the hepatic artery where you're infusing your chemo drug. Simultaneously, you have two balloons, one at the base of the heart and then one below in the IVC uh, that occludes 
the um that includes the uh let's see if I can have a pointer. Hopefully you guys can see my pointer. Um that includes the uh uh the IVC, but only allows for um hepatic venous drainage. And on this catheter, you can see there's many side holes in between the two balloons, which then suck the blood out as it comes out of the liver full of melphalan, then goes through this black box extracorporeal filtration before you then eventually return it back into the heart. Um, so essentially, it's the same concept. We're giving a super physiologic amount of chemotherapy directly into the liver, um, and this time, you know, filtering it out so we don't get the systemic toxicities that you might see. The first phase three trial for this was done in 2016. They had 93 patients, 44 were treated with this percutaneous hepatic perfusion, um, and then 49 were given best available care, which could have been anything, systemic therapy, immunotherapy, um, taste, et cetera. Uh, you can see the in the intention to treat population, the hepatic PFS was increased, um, but the overall survival was not increased, as you can see here. However, there was a lot of uh, crossover. So patients who were initially allocated to not get intrahepatic um, perfusion eventually did. And you can see if you control for that, there, there appears to be um, an overall survival benefit. Um, this was then again re retested um, subsequently. Um, uh, so this is the same uh, waterfall plot where you can see a lot of patients do, do respond to this therapy um, with only a few progressing. Um, so it, it does provide durable disease control in about 84% of patients. Uh, again, like we were seeing with the um, chemoembolization, survival is very much correlated with response. So you can see the patients who had a complete response, um, the median overall survival was not reached um, versus those who had no response or progressive disease. The survival was only about 12 months. So again, um, tackling the liver, getting some sort of disease control inside the liver is super important for these patients. Um, the biggest, uh, so before we get to the biggest trial, the next trial that came out was the scandium trial, which was a little bit different. It wasn't that complicated extracorporeal filtration. Um, they actually did this surgically, where they actually went into the IVC and clamped the IVC, um, and then did the same thing with the intraarterial perfusion. Um, obviously a much bigger procedure than, than uh, endovascularly. Um, but you can see here um, the patients uh, who were allocated to the hepatic perfusion did a lot better um, than patients who only had uh, best, avail best available care. Today, um, the FOCUS-3 trial, um, which was um, part phase three, part NOx, they did a trial design change partway through, looked at that per percutaneous hepatic perfusion with melphalan, um, and um, you can see 100 patients were so, uh, allocated to the hepatic perfusion, 42 to other therapies, um, immunotherapy, taste, et cetera. Uh, most importantly, the PFS was significantly prolonged, um, nine months versus only three months. Um, disease control rates were doubled um, to about 74% versus uh, just about 38%. Um, the median overall survival didn't quite reach... Um, uh, significance, although the, the, the trial wasn't necessarily powered for that, but you can see inklings towards potentially a, a survival benefit. Uh, I think what's also more interesting from this is we can see uh, potentially combining this with immunotherapy. And so there's a phase 1B that subsequently then had an expansion into a phase 2, um, which we're still waiting for the results from, but it was combining ipinevo uh, with this percutaneous hepatic perfusion. And you can see here that a lot of patients are responding with quite, you know, um, dramatic responses um, with the combination, uh, which can potentially say that um, we can hopefully optimize or improve the efficacy of ipinevo in this disease um, population. But again, we'll have to wait to see what the expansion arm shows. Moving on to radioembolization. Um, same concept, we're now instead of injecting chemotherapy, we're injecting uh, radiotherapy. It's really intraarterial brachytherapy is how I think about it. Um, there's two large um, studies um, that we have, one's a US-based and one's Finnish-based, um, showing uh, that depending on how you measure what using resist or M-resist, et cetera, um, you can have varying degrees of, of response rates. Um, although, you know, we're still kind of hovering around 20 to, to 40% responses. 
there's a phase two trial that looked at it at, at this, um, where you can see they, they had two different groups, patients who were treatment naive, and then patients who had previous immunoembolization. Uh, and you can see the overall survival was somewhat favorable um, at 19 months, uh, with a clinical benefit rate of about 87% um, if they were treatment naive and about 60% um, if they uh, they had previous uh, therapies, again, with about 30 to 40% um, response rates. Again, as we see with radioembolization, as we saw with the other types of therapies, patients who respond do significantly better. So if we can find ways to improve our response rates, um, I think we will see an improved overall survival. And so again, just like the previous therapy, I think uh, looking at the combination with immunotherapy is super intriguing. Um, so there's a phase one study uh, that looked at dose-reduced um, ipinevo or flipped ipinevo, as well as dose-reduced Y90. Um, and they showed that an objective response rate of about 20% and a disease control rate of 20%. Again, this is a pretty small um, um, cohort, but they showed that it was at least safe to combine ipinevo and Y90 without seeing increased um, toxicity. I think most people are worried about the lungs um, with this combination because um, some radiation does go to the lungs with the uh, radioembolization. Uh, Emory uh, then did a retrospective study of all of their ocular melanoma patients. Um, and they showed that patients who received immunotherapy um, within three months of having their Y90 uh, had a significantly improved overall survival, 26 months versus 9.5 months, um, suggesting that there may be synergy um, with, with the immunotherapy added on. So there's no trials, um, as far as I know, that are um, open right now looking at this. And lastly, I want to talk about immuno, immunoembolization. Uh, which is an interesting concept um, where instead of in, in putting chemotherapy into the uh, hepatic artery, what if we do some sort of immunogenic or immunostimulating agent? So initially this was done with uh, GMCSF, uh, again, in that ethiodized poppy seed oil, which is what we use as a medium to, to transport these drugs. Um, and, you know, we don't really know how this works. Maybe it changes the myeloid derived suppressor cells regulatory cells, maybe it's the TNF-alpha pathway. Um, it, it's really hard to tell, um, but it, it clearly does appear to have some efficacy. Um, when it's been com compared to just embolization, so um, just spheres um, directly into the hepatic artery to cause ischemia, um, it shows that for, for patients who have low liver involvement, it may not be different, but for patients who have a higher degree of liver involvement, they may, they may benefit from this. Um, I think out of outside of specialized centers, immunoembolization is not really performed. However, there's an intriguing variant of that, which is just coming out right now, which is nelatolamod, which is a toll-like receptor 9 agonist, which is infused intraarterially um, with a special catheter. Uh, they did a small phase one um, study um, using ctDNA response as a primary endpoint. Uh, and you can see uh, in their optimized group, they were getting about an 86% ctDNA response rate. Uh, and more importantly, imaging-wise, PFS was about 12 months, which is very encouraging um, uh, for, for these patients at, at, at the, uh, so was, uh, with 86% of patients responding um, or having a one-year overall survival based on the combined intra-arterial immunotherapy plus uh, systemic nivolumab. I think a lot more um, needs to be done in this space with this, but I think it's very intriguing to see intra-arterial immunotherapy combined with systemic immunotherapy. So in conclusions, um, I think there's been a lot of advances, particularly in percutaneous chemoperfusion. This is an example of one of our patients, um, which has shown that uh, you know we can potentially have higher and better outcomes than just chemoembolization alone. Um, there's a possibility to combine particularly Y90 tear uh, with checkpoint inhibition, though I think more study needs to be done there. Um, and newer transarterial immunotherapies may allow for improved, res Im improved responses um, compared to just systemic immunotherapy alone with relatively um, low toxicity profiles. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Berman. Um, sure there'll be questions there too. So Dr. Hamid has taken us home. Um, with uh, systemic agents in uh, metastatic or advanced uh, uveal melanomas. All right, great. So they pulled the Hamid on me and they left me with just enough time that I was given. So I'll go quickly. Uh, so this is the management of uh, <clears throat> advanced uveal melanoma. And a lot of what was said before really hits with this. A lot of 
slide. So quickly, comfort to cure is something that's there in cutaneous melanoma and will soon come in uveal melanoma. I love this slide because this is a melanoma doc out there, President of ASCO, Lynn Schuchter. Uveal melanoma, again, uh, no cure for the disease, minimal progress, little research. That's not true anymore. Targeted therapy, not successful. That's not true anymore. So I'll show you that. Fortunately, you know, as we've gone through this timeline of immunotherapy approvals in 2024 with lifilisol, Tabentafusp has shown that, you know, even uh, immunotherapy can work in tumors that are very immune inactive in an immune desert. How does that really work? Uh, it's an MTAC, it's a T-cell receptor by specific targeting intracellular proteins, immune mobilizing T-cell receptor against cancer. What's so great about it is it can target greater than 90% of the proteome via, via soluble TCR. So you put it in there, it brings the T cell close with CD3 and then the HLA expression of uh, protein uh, uh, protein fragments here. So GP100 is the one this looks at. It's the first line therapy for HLA A2 positives, the only drug that has shown survival advantage, interestingly decreasing the risk of death by 50%. And if you are ocular melanoma with metastatic disease, this is your first line therapy, why? Here's a survival advantage with a hazard ratio 0 0.68 in it, and it continues for years on out. Even patients who were on it have got progressive disease in this randomized trial, and the progressive disease arms that had seen it did better than progressive disease on the control arm. What's interesting here is that we're looking at in novel ways of understanding who benefits. This has changed from baseline of a tumor, like a waterfall plot in survival, but we're really not understanding there what's going on. And there's a shift to ctDNA for these tumors, which are hard to really image. And this is held true for other MTACs. So a reduction of ctDNA by 50%, which is a major molecular response showing survival advantage. Now we've brought that forward by looking at a newer MTAC that targets PRAME, as you can see on the top left, PRAME is prevalent on melanoma and other solid tumors. The drug has shown that it can uh, cause interferon gamma induction and T-cell trafficking. We're looking at a major combinations. Why, does that, why is that important? Well, you'll see that there's durable disease control. You can find a marker, biomarker for why this works. And um, you can show that it works in other solid tumors. What I didn't put in here is we looked at cutaneous melanomas and it can be combined these things with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, future trials with this are gonna combine with checkpoint inhibitor, chemotherapy, embolization. There's a adjuvant trial that's upcoming with MTAC for uh, GP100, uh, the Tabentafusp. Here's the Prame. And this is currently accruing at the Angelus Clinic for all solid tumors. We're understanding what happens and who benefits. And this is the idea of the phenotype of T cells that benefit from MTAC, but also holds true for CAR T and TIL. Only to say that TIL is happening for uveal melanoma. We won't discuss it here, but there are centers that do it, including UPMC and others. But earlier, less volume disease more naive to systemic therapy. These are the patients that have higher naive and stem cell memory T cells and respond better to CAR T, TIL, and MTAC therapy. What about Ipinevo? Well, Ipinevo works. It's got a very low response rate. Uh, it's got an overall response rate of 18%, and it's got a total benefit of about 51% with a low progression-free survival. There's two studies that have shown that it is an option for our HLA A2 negative patients in the first line, but there is more. This came out today. Well, I saw it today, it came out this month with uh, tumor treatment fields that are approved now for mesothelioma, approved for glioblastoma, now approved for non small cell lung cancer in the second line. And this is a trial we're doing with Justin Moser, uh, Justin Moser at uh, Honor Health. And it is using 
uh, initial 10 patients doing ipi nevo along with tumor treatment fields. And it's being accrued here. Oh, good Lord. It's being accrued here. Um, what about darvo crizotinib? And this is uh, presented by Meredith McKean. Uh, here, the data here is, again, the darvo uh, blocks the uh, PKC signaling, and then uh, the Crizo uh, blocks CMET and other drivers. This first in human study looked at the combination uh, with efficacy. It had heavy duty patients with uh, lots of disease, intrahepatic, extrahepatic, and other. Very tolerable. Look at the grade three toxicities, nothing crazy, diarrhea, edema, some hypotension. Here's the overall disease and control. Look, this is great. Love it. Look at the confirmed response rate, 30%. Look at the stability of disease, another 59%. It's about 89% disease control. First line, it's great. 90% disease control, 45% response. Hepatic only, 37%. And looking at HLA, A2 positive and negatives, it works. And um, here it is, regardless of HLA, A2 status, major molecular response is being seen in every li any line of therapy. There are some partial responders and stable disease and uh, not really in the progressive disease. So you can use this to monitor progression. Here's a progression-free survival that's significant in hepatic only and others. So a very interesting thing. It is now in a first-line trial in HLA-A2 negative metastatic uveal melanoma going forward for FDA approval as a first line in this population currently accruing. What about other things? What do you do if you've already been treated? What do you do if you don't like ipinevo because it doesn't have a long benefit? Well, oncolytics are coming forward here. This is from Replimude. RP2 is similar to RP1. RP1 is in being looked at in cutaneous as a second line. RP2 uh, <clears throat> combined or alone with nivolumab in a cohort of patients with uveal melanoma. This is a next generation oncolytic virus. They don't like us to call it TVIC, but it's from the guy who made TVIC. It looks like TVIC. It's a herpetic virus uh, and it codes uh, GMCSF. But RP2 sticks in, sneaks in CTLA-4. That's just very interesting. Why? Because it's local. Why? Because you can shut it off with an antiviral. Why? Because it lasts less time in the circulation. And uh, it was associated with at durable activity. Let me just show you this monotherapy here. Patients who had all seen anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. You don't need to see this response is great, but a picture speaks a thousand words. This is repetitive injection into the liver into a single lesion, showing what we really wanted to see response in the uninjected lesions throughout and durable. So why do I like this? Because this makes sense for a million different ways, but someone mentioned the immune inactive environment uh, in the liver. And that's true, we've published data along with others that show pound per pound, if you have the same volume of melanoma cutaneous in your body or lung cancer, non-small cell in your body, and you have liver metastases as part of that, you do worse, your survival is worse. So here's something from uveal going into uh, other tumors. But look at this, this is injected lesions. So you can repetitively inject into the liver and have response in uninjected lesions. If you were at ESMO, you saw that this works throughout the body in cutaneous melanoma. They showed immune activation and it's very safe. Look at the grade three, really some hypotension and some infusion related reactions. You don't see CTLA-4 types of toxicities. Overall response rate of 30% disease control around 60% and it has proof of principle. And it's now in a randomized phase two, three open label study, looking at this in combination with nivolumab versus ipilimumab and, and nevo in immune checkpoint inhibitor naive adult patients. Why is that important? You could be HLA-2 positive and see tabentafus and then come on to this study. You can be HLA-2 uh, negative and see the darvo Crizo combination and come on to the study. So you see multiple different options building combinations and a plan for our patients going forward. I got seven minutes. 
And this is now uh, about to be accruing. What else was there? This was at ESMO. This was a, I think, a, a mini oral. And this is citravatinib plus tizalizumab. So this is uh, pat uh, for patients with uveal melanoma. <clears throat> you don't need to know that. But look, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so that's tisilizumab <laughs> and stiv stiravatinib. It's an oral pan-TKI. Why was this interesting? They saw uh, responses that were uh, uh, durable. And I think what you're seeing here, when you look at these uh, in ocular melanoma, it's very, very hard to say someone has a CR right? It's hard to see responses. You saw it in Repl with the Replimune study, but I think we're more and more seeing disease control and durability. It may be that tumor is dying, but it may be that we can't see that change. And that's been something that we've been talking about. The overall response rate was similar uh, and the disease control rate 100, but this is 16 patients. But when you go back and you look at these, these are patients who had seen previous Tabentafus and other therapies. And what's interesting here is that the median overall survival looks great, 12 months, 80%, sign me up for that. Well, that trial is not accruing, but this is a nice trial. This comes from Ahmad Tarini, who is now at Moffitt, and we are partnering up with him with uh, <clears throat> Semiplumab, which is a very lovely anti-PD-1 inhibitor from Regeneron, plus ziv aflibercept for subjects with metastatic uveal melanoma. Those of you who are old and white haired like myself and Greg Daniels, we were in med school together. I like to say that all the time. Remember that as VEGF trap and that's accruing about a month or two here. It allows a heavily pretreated patients. We'll look at an initial 32 patients going forward. Uh, so that's VEGF trap. The greatest thing about VEGF trap, which I thought was very interesting when I came out of residency was that it targets multiple VEGFs, A, B, C, D, and I think there's an E. Um, not to be outdone, this drug was presented at uh, SMR about a year ago by Matteo Carlino, who is out there in Westmead and Blacktown Hospitals in Sydney. This is a drug that is now on hold. It's looking for a dance partner, um, but it's a Novartis drug. What's so great about it? antibody drug conjugates. If you take care of uveal melanoma and you say nobody wants to be there, there are no drugs, there is nothing that's absolutely wrong. I just showed you oncolytics. I just showed you targeted therapy. I just showed you novel VEGF therapy and of course, checkpoint inhibitor. And it's leading the field in uh, bispecific. So any type of bispecific would look good. This is an a ADC targeting GP100. Get back on here. And this is the mechanism of action. Uh, GNAQ11 mutations are in 95% of uveal melanomas, and that presents at uh, overexpressed as uh, uh, on the uh, on the cell surface. This is an antibody drug conjugate that targets that. It binds to PML on target cells, which is the expression there. Uh, so GP100, known as PML. And it's an ADC approach. That's wonderful. What did we see here? <clears throat> what did we see here? All of this, sorry. It's small, but you can see here in uh, increasing doses, you saw significant stability, disease, and control. That's the bottom left. Look at the bottom, uh, the top right. Great disease control and uh, duration of response at four months, 77% of patients remain on treatment. And at six months, 56%. And you're looking at a benefit here. We're just waiting for this to come back into trial. So great responses. Let me see where we are. We're almost there. Oh, I wanted to be sure to tell you that ocular melanoma can also talk to you and inform cutaneous melanoma. Because GNAQ is in some cutaneous melanomas, there were three patients treated here with cutaneous melanoma, and we're looking forward to some update there. There are chemokine expression profiles that are being looked at. This I love. This comes from Jose Lutsky, who is going to open a adjuvant trial in uveal melanoma, but 
He loved the fact that lag three was overexpressed. So now I'm showing you Relanivo uh, in, uh, in the uveal melanoma. Uh, <clears throat> and here's what they found. Some analysis to look at uh, who would respond well. Uh, the idea that TIGIT expression is high in the PD cohort. So, hey, maybe we should find someone who is sitting on a TIGIT and add it into there going forward. What about the trial itself? This was just presented at ESMO. Um, it was well tolerated, no unexpected safety signals, but this is what you want to see. You got about a 7% res partial response, about 11% stable disease. But what, why do I like this so much? Because this is a backbone to build on. As we're going in melanoma and you're seeing four drugs together, this can be put together with Tebentifos, and this can be put together, hopefully, with the Ipinivorella that's being looked at in cutaneous melanoma and going forward. Future thoughts, adjuvant trials and neoadjuvant we saw, TILT trials, CAR-T, Phase one trials do allow this, and we have novel and K cell trials. And this is not, a, I'm right on time. This is not a melanoma trial. This is a drug that's a off the shelf aloe and K. And this was uh, presented, it used to be an auto NK, but here's responses in sarcoma patients with NK cell therapy. So I think NK cell therapy is coming forward in uveal melanoma. Also, we're looking forward to the trials that allow that. And right on time, for the first time in my life, uh, these are my contacts. If you're interested in the slides, I'm happy to share. Great. Thank you. Um, I know we started two minutes late, so I'm going to take two minutes. And that is um, Dr. Veja, UC Irvine asked, um, are any of you guys incorporating uh, circulating DNA currently? If so, how are you doing that? Probably Dr. Hamid. Uh, I, I mean, we're trying to incorporate circulating DNA, but the issue with circulating DNA, it, it's difficult, right? Natera just gives you like a higher, lower, whatever. Uh, Tempest does all of the mutations that are circulating out there, so you can see numbers. Uh, the problem is it takes a, a very long time to turn around. So not the greatest, you know? Uh, so that's, I think, the problem for ctDNA for me. Um I think in uveal melanoma, something that would be better is the understanding of radiomics. Uh, how can we utilize the density changes, et cetera, to tell us what's going on? Oh, mm -hmm. there's another thing that I love and that I, I've usually put in my talks. It's the Imaginab uh, uh, antibody, pet antibody that targets CD8 T cells. And possibly you can utilize that. Now, uh, Mike Pasta is utilizing that in some preclinical things, if you see that you're giving the therapy and the T cells are going to the tumor after one or two, three doses, you can be, you can feel well. If not, you can probably add some more. The only problem with it is cost a lot. Patient needs to be on the scanner for like two hours in order to do the scan. So. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, what do you think about the next big breakthrough combination set of therapy plus liver directed treatment? Next big breakthrough. Well, Dr. Hamid just gave 10 trials that are great big breakthroughs. So I'll give it to Dr. Berman, um, something he sees um, that's exciting. Yeah, um, I, I really do think it's going to be the combination of, of some sort of local tumor modulation, um, local tumor microenvironment modulation plus systemic therapy. Uh, and I think kind of figuring out what type Right? Are we talking some sort of ablative type therapy? Are we talking oncolytic virus? Um, we're, we're not part of that particular RP2 trial, but we are part of an RP3 trial. Um, and we, so we've seen an efficacy in other tumor types. Um, or, or do we need to do, you know, toy receptor, local infusions, et cetera? Um, so I think kind of figuring out what type of modality to combine with immunotherapy um, could be um, really important. And I think that's going to be the next big, big breakthrough. So not necessarily treating the tumor to get a response, but treating the tumor to make the systemic therapy more, more responsive. Great. 
Tajid, uh, are there any data showing how previous treatments are impacting next line treatment for progressors? For example, Tizabab, HCC, I saw a slow forming liver fibrosis that might impact additional immune therapy or Y90. Um, so, sequencing of therapies, um, are you guys thinking about that? Um, kind of coming forward with your patients? Um, maybe Dr. Hamid? Yeah, I think sequencing is, you know, the first tenet of becoming a doctor, first do no harm. You know, if you give someone Ipinevo as a first line you in your in your clinic, you pretty much taken them away from a lot of the other options that are available. I will do a plug for Bart Chumowski, who has the Criso trial in the phase one, two still open, so you can put heavily pretreated patients on that but that's nearly closed. So a lot of what you're gonna do for these patients is dependent on being able to sit down and say, look, your HLA A2 is this. You need to see this for survival benefit and then go on to these, but you won't lose those options. And then ensuring that you go forward. The other caveat is, um, there's, there's also, there's, you know, there's uh, perspective sequencing, but there's also parallel sequencing here that when we haven't talked about the role of the radiation oncologist, uh, I have two that are very wonderful who have a huge experience in radiation for immune effect, uh, Stephen Shao and Tony Nguyen. And uh, I love, you know, when I have patients who are sort of progressing on immunotherapy and they're very with one or two lesions, uh, radiating those lesions and trying to push through and see what happens there if they're patients who don't have other options. So yeah, I, I mean, I just showed you, you can take someone through uh, Darvo Criso, then take them through the RP2 therapy, and then take them through, at that point you can do Ipinevo or take them through another phase one clinical trial. VEGF trap plus PD one. Now you don't then you don't lose anything. Yeah. So I think again, as you guys are pointing out, that uh, times are changing from you know from nucleations now, you know, possibility for neoadjuvant, shrink them down, still preserve vision, um, to localized therapies that are finally moving the survival curve. And uh, Dr. Hamid, who seems to have every study in the world. Um, so uh, I think we'll wrap it up. And uh, maybe Dr. Lashkari, if you have any last words. Oh, I just wanted to thank everyone for a, a wonderful event. I think we've learned a lot. Um, um, I, you know, what's always interesting to me is how uh, so many patients get on these trials because uh, I know that we don't see too many of them. So it's good that that there are a lot of trials and patients who are being enrolled um, because that's really the only way we're going to learn more about this disease. So thank you. Um, Dr. Daniels for moderating this event. Thank you, Dr. Hemi, Dr. Scott, Dr. Berman for joining us and um, to the rest of our uh, uh, audience. Thank you so much for joining us and participating. And uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks.